The Dark Room, exploring the strange and controversial, with your hosts, Paul Salvatore and Jordan Randall. Today we're talking with the Six Dad, Norm Kelly. Okay. So what do you prefer? Do you prefer Norm or Norm. Mr. Kelly? Norm. Or Norm? Okay, yeah. thank you, Norm. So thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Yeah. So, um, of course, I know when people um, think of you now, they have the associations of The Six and Drake and things like that. But even before we get into that, um, I want to ask you if um, someone was meeting you for the first time, I didn't know anything about you, um, and asked you, what kind of politician are you? How would you reply? I'm a politician who um, looks at the broader picture mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, and I try to look at issues in greater depth, I think, than most, and that may be because of my background in history. Mm -hmm. um, I try to be rational. Um, Fair, uh, pragmatic. The um, I think that's you know I could maybe um, break those concepts down into sub uh, you know into a subtext, but that's I think um, would be uh, the broad brush mm -hmm. portrait of myself. So you've served many years in politics. Is it fair to say over 20? This is my 32nd wow. year. Incredible. So, I mean, do you remember what um, was your primary motivation at the very beginning to start? I've been asked that question many times, and the answer is no. <laughs> okay. Um, there are many people who, uh, uh, who enter politics out of a sense of noblesse oblige. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would argue that John Tory fits that mold. Uh, born into a very wealthy, prominent family, where I am assuming that politics was part of the the conversation at the dinner table. So it was maybe uh, you know in that context, uh, the assumption uh, might be um, it's expected of me uh, to get involved uh, in a way that gives back. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the larger society for the for the economic um, uh, position that we uh, that we enjoy and the social standing that we have as well. Others like um, Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, had a fire in him. Uh, he was actually a, an agent of social change, and most people looking at him without seriously uh, reading about him. Uh, Robert, uh, uh, I think it was Robert Cato or Caro who's written a four-volume biography mm -hmm. of him, um, wouldn't know that uh, he went into politics uh, in order to improve the standard of living of the people in uh, West Texas. They had been attracted there in the uh, uh, mid and late 19th century because it was so lush and green. Uh, but that was an aberration, apparently, historically. It was a very dry area. Uh, and so uh, they lived an impoverished life, and it was his goal to uh, um, redress, um, you know, their the grievances that many of these people felt, uh, not only against nature, but against a system that that uh, really hadn't come to their assistance. Um, my dad um, read uh, newspapers, mm -hmm. didn't read books, he read newspapers, and uh, he would comment on, uh, on uh, things that were happening. Um, I would listen to him. Mm -hmm. I don't remember engaging him uh, in uh, protracted conversations, but I remember as an what eight-year-old sitting down in the living room with the newspaper spread in front of me and reading it from cover to cover. Uh -huh. 
And my earliest memories are of me coming out of the library as a little boy with uh, books on um, classical Greece, <laughs> Rome, right. China. Amazing. Um, so I, yeah. who knows? I when know. I first ran for office, I was 13 years old in grade 9 when I ran wow. for student council. Incredible. It's, it's natural pull to politics and history, I guess. So now they're calling you Six Dad. I mean, what is the, uh, the thing behind that? What's the history behind that? Well, after I innocently wandered onto the, the, the hip-hop rap battlefield right. by uh, telling uh, Meek Mill not to, that he wouldn't be welcome in Toronto, right. um, my followers in a very short order, a month, maybe two months, went from 10,000 to over 100,000. Uh, and uh, I noticed that when they tweeted uh, to me or about me to others, they described me as dad. And I finally said, why are you calling me dad? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not your dad. Right. Uh, why are you calling me dad? And uh, the response, uh, that was just opening the door to, to more, more dadisms. Uh, and uh, they were very kind in their interpretation. Hey, we like you. You know, yeah. this is a term of endearment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, it then progressed from there to Six Dad because um, I'm identified uh, with Drake, mm -hmm. and he is the Six God. Okay. And so I went from Dad to the Six Dad. Right. So Toronto... The six mm -hmm. has not only a six god, it right. has a six dad as well. I mean, interestingly enough, I saw on your tweet, um, sorry, on one of your, um, your retweets, I think, uh, someone was saying that they wish that uh, you were their dad. <laughs> so it's getting like, very personal now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you actually, uh, you mentioned it right now. So uh, some are saying that the precursor to your whole relationship with Drake um, is that you came to his defense on Twitter. Um, well, prior to that, right? Um, in a conscious effort to build the account, to attract more followers, right. uh, I would poke fun at him. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, because I knew that he was very popular. Right very uh, important to uh, to a lot of people and if I mentioned him I would attract by association I would uh, attract attention right but it was gentle fun right uh, there was nothing um, vicious uh, about it um, and it's almost like a family if I'm your brother mm -hmm. I can poke fun at you uh, I can I can goof around with you wrestle but if someone outside the family says something about you, right. I'm there to defend you. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, and I couldn't figure out why Meek Mill, a week before he was coming to Toronto in right. concert, would, would uh, attack uh, Toronto's native son. Um, so that's, that's uh, what prompted the, uh, the, that particular tweet. Right. And... Uh, I've been associated with hip hop and rap ever since. Right. So, for those who don't know, I mean, how would you describe the way he um, he attacked Drake and um, his response to you when you came to his defense? Well, rap. Um, you know, one of the, f the f as soon as I realized that this new audience I had was basically uh, millennials mm -hmm. who uh, were grouped around hip hop and rap. Uh, I went to the library and I got three books out on hip hop music and culture. Interesting. Okay. And there I was at home sitting there with the books in front of me, making <laughs> notes as if I'm preparing for an exam or, right. or writing an essay. Yes. Uh, and I did that because um, if you're going to have a conversation with that cohort, you better learn the language. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Meek, the original rappers. Um, uh, there was a spontaneity to their, to their, uh, 
what historians would call chants. They're chanting mm. um, more than singing. Right. There's a spontaneity to that uh, because everything was supposed to be a reflection of life on the streets. Um, but today, the more successful rappers uh, either take their time rap, you know, writing the lyrics or they have other people writing the lyrics for them. Right. And Meek was attacking Drake because he said, you don't write your lyrics. <laughs> you know, I'm calling you out. Right. Uh, so uh, I think earlier, either earlier, just prior to that or shortly afterwards, someone in a tweet said, what's your relationship with Drake? And my response was, I'm his guardian angel. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's uh, it's so interesting. I mean, um, do you think that you would be friends with him today if it weren't for you coming to his defense that time? Um, I I don't know. The um, I became aware of his of his importance to the city when I became, in essence, the de facto mayor of the city. Mm -hmm in Ford's, the last year of Ford's administration. Um, and um, I always thought of him uh, as uh, the perfect face for Toronto's brand going into the 21st century. You know, young, multicultural, talented. Um, but whether that would have, over time, uh, been converted to friendship. Uh, I don't know. I mm -hmm. suspect not. But the uh, walking onto the battlefield and taking my sword out mm -hmm. and putting my shield up um, put the two of us together. Mm -hmm. And I think another contribution to um, the association was Ryerson University's right. invitation mm -hmm. to. Uh, join Drake and Future on stage at the uh, uh, Ryerson Frosch uh, event. Yeah. Um, and um, I think there were six or 7,000 yeah, students huge. out there. Yeah. And it was a drizzly night. Um, and uh, at first I thought I would be up front, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even introducing the, the acts or bringing... Uh, greetings from council, which is traditional, mm -hmm. but they saved me for the la for the last, uh, and so the concert is basically over, and the, MC the MC is going well. Hey guys, before you leave, got a special guest, you know, Councillor Norm Kelly, the Six Dad, and I walk out on stage and it says, "Wow," uh, and I had talked with the uh, student union reps. Right. earlier in the evening, and I said, look, at." they said to me, what are you going to say? And I said, well, I'm not too sure, but I know I'm not going to say very much because uh, you're not going to hold their attention. You know, a guy like a politician ain't going to hold their attention very long. So I said, it's got to be really short. And they said, well, can we recommend a line to right. you? And I said, terrific. Right. And it was Ryerson Turn Up. <laughs> I remember reading And, and uh, I said, well, that's easy. And she said, yeah, but we recommended that to uh, Levy, the president. Okay. And apparently he was the guy that opened the show. Okay. And he said to him, turnip? Well, why turnip? Why not potatoes? Why not, <laughs> why not carrots? And they said, no, it's turnip. Right. Anyway, he gets on stage and he says, Ryerson, turn it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the way it goes. So I'm going, all right, all right, I got to, that's it. So wow. I get out there. The one thing I um, asked for for that evening was the Ryerson I, hockey yes, jersey. That's right. Uh, so I had that on. I wanted mm -hmm. to make that instant connection right. uh, with uh, the students. So I walk out. I've got the Ryerson jacket on. I sort of walk back and forth, and I'm waving at them. And then it's just Ryerson, turn up, and it's you know. <sighs> All right. And I catch out of the corner of my eye, Drake, and he's doing this. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> You know, he's bowing, he said he's you know, like, unworthy. It's, uh, and I, I looked over at him and I went, I waved at him, you know, come join me. And mm -hmm. he walked out and when he got up to me, I turned my back and he turned his right. back and we went back to back. 
and right. uh, photographs just from wow. all over. Did, did he say it that? Was, yeah. It was a, an incredible feeling. Absolutely. I mean, did, he said, "Aren't you my hero?" He said, "I'm your hero," or "You're my hero." Sorry. Oh, that was when it, we first met. Oh, that was okay. Because I had been out there defending him against that right. bully, <laughs> Meek Mill. <laughs> See, there's a drama. I don't yeah. know my drama. I think people very, are. very sociable guy, very easygoing, relaxed mm-hmm. sort of guy. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know what your audience is uh, like for the podcast, but the th- the besides that, the mm. other memory I have of that evening on stage is us leaving. He's got his arm around me, and I, you know, I I've got mine around him. We're walking to the back of the stage, and all you can hear in the background is six thousand people chanting, "Fuck Meek Mill! <laughs> Fuck Meek Mill!" <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> it was that's incredible. That's a true show, uh, show of like six solidarity. Yeah. You know. So um, <laughs> no, that that you know that's it's so interesting. That's that's all happening. Yeah, I run. Right? So, I run with a rowdy crowd. Yeah. <laughs> no, I ha- I just have one final like before I, I just turn the mic to dry. I just have to ask. Like, I mean, apart from Drake and uh, the concert and things like, I mean, how much do you feel hip hop is part of your own life? Do you listen to it? Do you go to shows or how? I do. I've uh, I've got uh, that's my background music now in the. Oh, office. is it okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And uh, did you ever watch the movie, uh, the TV series Empire? Uh, a little bit, not so much. Maybe joined you. I've heard really good things yeah. about it, but okay. I've never actually. Well, seen well it's, you know, it's it's. I know what it's about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, my wife loves it, mm-hmm. um, but I'm so busy that we don't get a chance to watch the uh, TV shows when they're aired. Right. So we PVR them. Okay. Uh, and what we'll do when, and it could be Sunday morning or we come home late after a, one gala or event or another and we'll watch it from 11 o'clock to maybe 2 or 3 in the morning, especially if it's a Friday night. Uh, and so we had Empire on there. Right. And at one point, she turned to me and she said, what, I don't understand, what are they saying? And I looked at her and I said, hey, I know what they're saying. <laughs> so I, I took the, the, their vocabulary and right. interpreted it for them. Broke it down. So it's, uh, it's intertwined now, and I'm doing this podcast. Right. So it's intertwined in, uh, in my life right now. I think, you know, if you made a rap single, it would probably do considerably well. Well, have you ever thought about actually making rap music? At first I didn't. Yeah. But uh, now uh, if I'm out gardening or shoveling snow... Right. Right. I start chanting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, Meek Mill called me a thug. Oh yeah, you know, and I'm trying to work the lyrics around. I'm a thug. You know, and there's a chorus that goes, "You a thug, you a thug." And that I'm, would work well. Like, you know, watch out. I'll, you know, you'll yeah. get a slug. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That's amazing. We yeah, we'll produce it. <laughs> we, we have we we do music too. No problem. So yeah, no drama. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I want to say that I think that it's absolutely fascinating what you said about the Ryerson performance and how, you know, it was very conscious that the attention spans of the people that, you know, were there for this performance were going to be limited to that of a politician being introduced on stage and that they had to try and sort of cross, cross over sort of genres here to make it acceptable by these people. I think it's fascinating because I think that that's something that has become like a big part of who you are and how you handle your politics, right? Because you are skating that line between politics, but then you're also making it not quote unquote boring for the younger demographics that could, you know, I'm real. I am really so happy with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like a, it's a, it's a great thing because it becomes relatable again. And it's, it's interesting because just, on a certain level of parallel, but obviously not the same thing. I can't help but think of Rob Ford and his trajectory and how it became, he became a relatable guy to younger demographics. And then that sort of made his whole presence that much more known and felt throughout the Mm -hmm. city. Do you feel that that's like something that you maybe consciously sort of took on a lesser scale and decided to utilize that as part of your notoriety? Well, what most people, um, don't realize that I had a teaching career of about 15 years. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, and uh, when I meet students today, later, uh, 
And when I look at them, I think, geez, you look old. <laughs> you know, was it really that long ago? Mm -hmm. um, I, get, I get good feedback. People, my former students, tend to say nice things about me. Uh, and so it would appear that they enjoyed that relationship as well. So what I've done through uh, hip-hop and rap is to reestablish that relationship. I feel very comfortable around young people. For sure, for sure. Yeah. And, so, uh, you, know, you know, there's that old, that hoary old concept, of young at heart. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've been young looking, uh, young and youthful in my behavior, uh, and young at heart for most of my life. So um, I don't think there's anything artificial about it, and I think that's what, what yeah. uh, millennials sense and react to. For sure, yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about that. So I've read some stuff online about people questioning the validity of these, some of these tweets because I guess they find it so, so mind-boggling to <laughs> imagine <laughs> that someone of your stature would be tweeting something that's so seemingly relatable to people of a younger demographic. So what would you say to those well, people? Well, right up front, um, um, I made uh, three basic decisions. Um, because I didn't know that much about the Twitterverse, right. uh, but I thought going in, um, I won't use um, the account as a personal diary. Mm -hmm. And most of the people that I knew, certainly at City Hall, mm -hmm. um, use it that way. This is who I am, this is, it, or, or yeah. this is who I'm with, and this is what we're talking about, and you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So no personal diary. Secondly, I would not use it as an extension of my political life. If you want to know where I stand on issues, there's my record. Do some research. Mm -hmm. uh, and thirdly, I would make it less about myself and more about Toronto. And as well, the quirkiness of living in the, in the modern urban you know, lifestyle. Right, right, right. And uh, as things got going, and especially after I made the connection with millennials, um, I, and in response to questions like these, mm -hmm. um, I began to understand that um, I, I've created an approach, stir, which I label as stir the pot, mm -hmm. tickle the spot, and inform. Uh, and over time, um, I've learned from Twitter Canada itself what they think makes attractive tweets, mm -hmm. and keep them uh, the 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 secret not the secret the the recipe mm -hmm. that they that they propose, uh, and I've repeated this publicly a number of times. Keep the tweet as short as possible. Uh, have visuals. Now I have someone that looks after the photographs for me. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a that's a time consuming operation. All right. So um, I'll say to him, look at here's here's what I have in mind. Mm -hmm. um, this is what I would like to to say. This is the fun I want to make. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it's goofy, silly fun. Other times it's sly. Mm -hmm. Um, I put out a tweet on Shreddies, right. and I said I, I I enjoy Shreddies, but and I prefer the diamond shape. Well, it's a square. <laughs> it's <just turned> over. <laughs> Shreddy is a square, right. but if you turn it, yeah, right. it's, it's a diamond. <laughs> and you know, a lot of people went duh, <laughs> but I love it when the light goes on and someone oh, said, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> now I get it. Um, and uh, it's more like a, if this were in print, I would be writing a column. Mm -hmm. Right. It would be a column on, you know, observations on modern life. And so uh, I pick up what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes I'll say to someone, uh, I like that. I said, if it appears in a tweet, I want you to know that I'm going to take authorship. <laughs> you, know, and they, you know, they'll laugh. And yeah. I could, uh, I generally, I have to work with it to tighten it. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of stuff 
you know comes from that mm-hmm. um, sometimes on a on a sunny afternoon in my study I'll take out a piece of paper and I read I read four newspapers a day mm-hmm. and I'm always ripping stuff out yeah. and jotting stuff on it uh, I remember one day I wrote five pages of tweets just wow. sitting there uh, and I didn't use any of them immediately because I found that if I leave something sit for two or three days mm-hmm. and I come back to it, it doesn't always seem that funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'll put an, uh, scratch that one out, but that one is st- I'm still giggling at that, so I'm going to use it. Uh, right. And uh, it's uh, and the, the stuff that I retweet, if you look at... Toronto Life did a profile on me, yeah. and I was surprised. They said I tweet 6.7 times a day, so round that up, seven tweets a day. That's not a lot. Mm. I'm, I don't deal in volume, yeah. but I do right. try to, to deal in quality. Right. Sure, yeah, it shows. It shows. For sure. I mean, like, I wanted to ask, too, like, do you have any history in comedy? I mean, because you are a really funny guy, and it shows in these tweets. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up at Dufferin and St. Clair, yes. uh, there was the St. Clair Theater, mm-hmm. the Royal George, yes. and the Paramount within walking distance. And my earliest, among my earliest memories are going to the Saturday matinee. And in those days, uh, and you could get in for a dime. Wow. <laughs> uh, in those days, it was a bunch of cartoons, a serial... Uh, and a double bill, usually westerns. Mm-hmm. And I grew up on Laurel and Hardy. Uh, and um, the um, the Bowery Boys. Um, Abbott and Costello. Um, you know the uh, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a hole there when I'm at at uh, university, you know, being serious and <laughs> studying and writing exams and stuff like that. Right. But Monty Python. Oh, yeah. all right. When um, uh, I only served one term in Ottawa, yes. uh, but I did my very best uh, as a member of the Liberal Caucus. It's part of the parliamentary order of government is a team sport. And uh, having played a lot of team sports, um, that fit right in with with uh, my approach to things. Uh, and um, with the change of leadership from Trudeau to Turner, uh, and I was a very strong supporter of Turner's, I organized Scarborough for him. Mm-hmm. Um, the word got out when Turner began to uh, play with the cabinet mm-hmm. that I was going to be appointed to it. So I get these phone calls from the media, Norm, um, hey, it looks like you're going to be uh, in the cabinet. Well, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, but uh, one guy said to me, I've seen the list. You're on it. What ministry would you like? And I replied, the ministry, the minister of silly walks. <laughs> <laughs> the guy said, he sort of stared at me. And I thought, mm, I guess I should have been a bit more serious. So con- comedy has always been there. Right. Uh, and uh, I can remember uh, the, um, my wife related this to me. Um, the fire department used to have uh, a fancy dinner every year mm-hmm. uh, during which it handed out awards to the media. Right. Uh, the various aspects of the media mm-hmm. who reported on the fire department. Yeah. Uh, and um, my wife was making uh, arrangements with, with whoever was hosting, uh, in charge of hosting the uh, uh, that event. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, my wife said, you know, um, she told, this person told my wife Charlotte that the fired, the, the f- firemen who were going to go to the event were all jostling to sit at our table. All right. <laughs> because my reputation among them as a result of previous uh, events right. was that I was a funny bugger. <laughs> Hey, you're going to enjoy it. Him and his wife, Charlotte, are a, are a laugh. You'll really have a good time. So yeah. that, 
th- that's a part of me and it's a natural part of me. But for, for a lot of my life, of mm-hmm. course, I'm dealing with serious issues mm-hmm. in a serious manner. All right. Are there other politicians that have this sort of ability to toggle between the two, just like you? Because, I mean, I, to be honest, from an outside perspective, I always, my whole life, I just picture politicians being the most serious people. They don't, like, laugh at anything. They just go and have, like, meetings, and everyone's just... Well, you know what I found? I've, I sat on Miller's cabinet. Mm-hmm. We have a unique system at City Hall. It's a hybrid between you know, the, the looseness of the American congressional system mm-hmm. and the caucus discipline in the Canadian parliamentary system. It's, we have a bit of both. Uh, and uh, I served in Miller's cabinet. Now, he's NDP. Mm-hmm. Uh, and whenever I went to various events with members of that executive, mm-hmm. man, did we have a ball. <laughs> <laughs> they were funny funny people they could take a a drink we would laugh dance it was just good fun the right tends to be uptight (laughs) (laughs) Um, they uh if i had to if i had to choose people i'd party with Mm -hmm. it would be on council it would be (laughs) the members of the left you know they can be serious one moment Mm -hmm. uh, and the next you know, let's have some fun. And I like that. Yeah. I like that combination. That's good, yeah. I don't like people who are serious all the time. Oh, oh God. I know. Serious. Um, but, uh, you know, I want to ask about um, a little bit more hip-hop, if that's okay. Um, because, you know, I was just talking to Jordan before you got here about uh, another hip-hop artist um, who uh, who made a statement recently about you. Do you know about this? Um, is is that, that the the guy who's featured on now? Yeah, I Jazz think? Carty. I want to yeah. just get your take on that. Like, what what did you, what did you feel? Well, when I've you first... um, um, among my more most persistent critics are those who claim that I'm a culture of culture oh. vulture. I had never heard that term before. <laughs> uh, he's he's using our culture to advance himself. Or to advance his popularity, and yet he's done nothing for the the black community in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Well, my response to that is, uh, geez, have you looked at my record? Mm-hmm. Um, they hadn't, and it was interesting uh, because the the the, uh, the guy who is most prominently identified with that criticism uh, spent most of his life outside of Toronto, mm-hmm. uh, and has just recently come back and gotten in, uh, involved in, in the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, if he had taken the time to either look at my record or if he had phoned me up and said, hey, you know, this is, how, this is what I see, what do you say to that? I could have brought him up to date with, I think, is it, uh, um, an important record of my contribution to the black community in, in Toronto. Now, most of our social programs are not ethno ethno culturally specific we don't say we're going to do something specifically for uh the black community or the south asian community if we're going to help youth it's youth uh and in in many areas in minority areas and of course members uh, black youth are going to be obviously a part of that um i could go i could give you four or five examples of my record. I sat on the Toronto Community Housing Company's first board when the uh, city amalgamated and amalgamated the, the social housing agencies. Mm-hmm. And I was part of the board that came up with the template for the revival of, of uh, social housing complexes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's playing out first in Regent Park and that template will be used for Lawrence Heights and others as mm-hmm. well. Uh, when I was a member of Parliament, uh, I had, Trudeau gave us at that time in the early 80s, $100,000 per member. Mm-hmm. Use it at your discretion in your riding. And I did. And amongst the first organizations that I supported was Tropicana. 
And Tropicana was one of the first agencies in Scarborough back in the day that served the black community. I also gave out leader grants to leadership groups or organizations that were holding leadership seminars for black youth in Scarborough. Um, when I was the de facto mayor of the city, um, I held eight deputy mayor, because I couldn't use the title mayor, mm -hmm. um, eight deputy mayor economic roundtables. And what my staff did was they took the, uh, the economy of the city and they divided it into eight categories. Uh, and one of them was the black business community. So I specifically had one for that community. Uh, but if you had asked Cartier, okay, uh, uh, you know, to have articulated uh, his concerns, I don't think he could have. Yeah, I, I And you know, it's a full, it's a, it's, to me, it's a weird concept. Hmm. Um, we identify rap with the black community, and I'm white, and so if I enjoy it, or get involved with it, I'm a culture vulture. Well, gee, I, uh, I enjoy jazz, um, the blues. These are, con these are musical contributions by uh, the American African community. And I think the world enjoys that music. Why can't they enjoy rap? So the concept itself is strange uh, in my uh, yeah. In my eyes. I mean, do you feel that's part of the larger issue or maybe a problem for yourself of people? Because we were also talking just before you got here, in the last couple of months or so, there's been articles, you know, uh, in uh, Canadian media to the fact that Norm Kelly is too much on Twitter, not enough in politics. Um, and I'm just so curious to, but you're never in the article, right? So it's always like an opinion piece. But uh, how would you respond to these? Take a look at my record. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Just do some homework. Mm -hmm. um, by and large, this is my sense. This is coming from uh, um, an age group um, that has a very, uh, is probably more left wing mm -hmm. than I am. I'm more of a centrist. Uh, uh, and they're letting, um, they're viewing me perhaps with a more ideological lens than other people would, uh, and none of them have taken the time to research the record. Mm -hmm. So um, just to get back to uh, being deputy mayor, I'm very curious to know the news that you would become, I guess, the was it acting mayor, or I couldn't use that title. What what I was just simply the deputy. You're just mayor. still the deputy mayor. That's right. Um, I, he, I, he they took the most effective authorities that he had right. and transferred them to me. Right now, if you're a deputy mayor, before that and afterwards, mm -hmm. deputy mayors um, were appointed by the mayor. Mm -hmm. But they didn't get any extra money, any extra salary. They didn't get any extra space, office space. And they didn't get extra budget, and they didn't get extra staff. So the deputy mayor in the city of Toronto's constitution is, in a way, like the vice president of the United States. Right. You know, you do what the mayor asks or invites you to do. And so I was appointed in mid-August. The authorities were transferred in mid October. So what's that? Two months. So for two months, as Mayor Ford's deputy mayor, mm -hmm. my job was, uh, at his request, to uh, receive uh, foreign dignitaries at City Hall uh, and go out and make speeches to this organization or another. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Uh, I can't remember now where I read exactly, but it was something to the effect that... Um, a bunch of politicians, they came to your office and they're like, this guy just made a, a comment about oral sex and women. It's, a, it's over for him. And now you're in charge. Is that kind of how it, it happened? That's exactly how it happened. Oh, you yeah. know, the elevator. Have you been to City Hall? Yeah. The main elevator right. is right 
opposite the mayor's office. Okay. Uh, and uh, so uh, when things re- when the when the the shit hit the fan right. with the uh, the mayor's disclosure that yeah I I use you know I use drugs, um, you couldn't walk from the elevator. He couldn't walk from the elevator to his office, wow. which couldn't be more than fifteen or twenty feet, without going through thirty or forty media, uh, and. Uh, so he was running a gauntlet of, of questions when he finally made that disclosure. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were just, he was bombarded with questions. He was clubbed with questions. Right. And uh, he made that, right. that statement. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it was the next day uh, that... Uh, four members of council, I, I remember four, it could have been three, it could have been five, walked into my office. They almost materialized like they were beamed down, you know. Right, right. Uh, and it was, Norm, that was it. Um, we figured out a way of dealing with this. Um, and you're the guy. Wow. <laughs> Are you up for it? And I had spent a, the previous month privately giving Mayor Ford my best advice. Mm. Here's what's best for the city government, for the city of Toronto, and for your uh, political life. And if you can get away for a while, clean yourself up, um, we can stabilize things, and when you come back, um, you'll have a good chance to run for uh, re-election. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, it just... I was joined at one par- uh, point by his brother, mm-hmm. but we couldn't, we couldn't get that across. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so this was the... And there was a real fear that the province might step in. And how, what would it look? You know, the country's number one city, the premier city in Canada, a mature order of government... Mm-hmm. That the province had been increasingly given more authority. We have we can do stuff that no other city uh, in Ontario or Canada can do. Going into receivership, that was unthinkable. Senior staff were 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 fretting like holy smokes. I'm going to be identified with the collapse of 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 a government. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when they said to me, "This is what we're going to do." Are you ready? Uh, my response was, because I understood this, was right. yes. I mean, that uh, I feel that would make someone pretty nervous to have all that pressure all at once. To be... Well, you know, it's like, I don't know, what do, what do hockey teams getting ready for the playoffs do? They generally add a veteran or two, don't they? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A guy that's been there. Uh, and that's how I felt. I see. You know, I'm the veteran. I'm here to quiet people down. Mm. You know, don't panic. This is this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. And what made it um, maybe easier for me than maybe f- for uh, others is that I had sat on Miller's executive, mm-hmm. so I knew the left. And I was sitting on Ford's executive, so I knew the right. And uh, I knew the their personalities as well as their their politics, so I could I could figure out ways of combining combining the two uh, going forward. Yeah, I mean, did you feel like you just had to keep a steady ship until the next election? Yeah, yeah. Well, one senior bureaucrat said to me, Norm, and it took it, this is what took me aback, and it panicked me for a, for a short while. We're all riding on your coattails. Wow, yeah. You know, you go, whoa. Yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> yes. But I had, uh, I had the, ma- the majority of the mayor's... St- I had office space. Right. I had the majority of the mayor's staff. Mm-hmm. And I had a majority of the, uh, the mayor's budget. So I had the tools to do the job. Mm-hmm. And one of the first changes that I made was to uh, emphasize the team. We held a, a scrum, and I introduced all the members that had come over from Ford's office to mine wow. as part of the team. 
This is just this just yeah. isn't me. This is my team. Oh. These are all wonderful, capable people. Right. The second thing I did was I kept my doors open. Mm -hmm. You know, Ford always had a big guy with him. Oh, did he? Uh, <laughs> protecting him. Wow. I, I that's opened, right. That's right. I he opened did have the door. Yeah. So if I'm in the office right. and you're a member of council and you walk in and want to talk to me, right. I'll talk with you. I'm there. I'll put whatever I'm doing aside and I'll talk with you. And from time to time, when I had some free moments, right. I would actually walk the second floor and walk in and talk with their staff mm -hmm. and just chat with them. Uh, and uh, I was really pleased when, say, a month or so into my administration, um, I asked the staff that, that worked with, uh, with the second floor right. uh, in one committee or another, I said, well, how are things going? And they said, well, for the first time, we're welcome in offices. Wow. Before, when they were there on Ford's behalf, there was always that, mm. that tension. I mean, so I was yeah. I'm thinking... Well, whatever it is I'm doing, it's working. So I'll just try and keep on doing it. All right. I mean, have you ever thought about running for mayor? I ran twice for the mayor's office in Scarborough. Okay. In 84, mm -hmm. I guess 85 and 88. Uh, in 85, I thought I, the context was there for victory. Mm -hmm. But uh, Gus Harris, mm -hmm. who had a, like an 83% recognition level mm -hmm. uh, didn't um, as he had indicated he would didn't retire okay. and on the last day for filing nomination papers I'll be damned if he didn't file oh, his really? papers and I thought oh. that's it game over uh, there were there were three strong candidates running for the office mm -hmm. and I would have I beat them in the in the vote right uh, as I knew I would but there was no way that you could beat Gus Harris. Right. Uh, in 88, I thought I had victory. Wow. It's the only race that I've won in my life. I've fought 14 elections, wow. and I've been able to call them all except right. that one. I was delighted at the number of people and the caliber of people who approached me mm -hmm. um, during that year as, de as the de facto mayor right. who were willing to support me uh, in an election. But the key issue there was John Tory. Mm -hmm. Is he going to run? He's not going to run. Olivia's going to run. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be a Ford there. Yeah. Um, so who's going to be the centrist candidate? And it turned out to be uh, John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me to have declared, knowing that it, you need two million dollars to run a wow uh, a serious campaign wasn't in the cards but yeah. you know what I was there I got the t-shirt and the cap right right <laughs> interesting wow it's a lot of money it's not exactly a grassroots <laughs> office. it is the single yeah. most expensive wow. office to run for if you want to be prime minister right you have a ceiling of uh, I don't know 75,000 okay to run in wow. your riding yeah because you're running not for the office of prime minister you're running to be a yes. member of parliament right right and so you run under the same conditions as the other 300 right. or so right wow. yeah, interesting yeah. you know you grew up during a time when it was toronto the good and now when i talk to people you know of my parents generation things like that they're like i don't know i don't know it used it's always that kind of lament oh, it used yeah. to be toronto the good now it's i don't i mean how do you you've seen the toronto whole, fun city yeah, or, or, you know, like it's the whole gentrification thing and things like that. Everything just being flipped. And, um, I mean, some of those homes, you know, down where my mom grew up in Little Italy, just well, astronomical. Know, Toronto today, yeah. I think, has a more youthful feel to it. Right. It wasn't that there weren't young people previously. Right. But um, the, the goal of young people previously was to get married right. fairly early on. Uh, settle down, raise a family. That's a very important and serious, you know, lifestyle that you've you've chosen. Mm -hmm. Well, today, um, people don't get married that early, right? And so you have a almost a singles culture. Yeah. Uh, some authors argue that adolescence has been extended, you oh, know, yeah. into the into the twenties. Right. Uh, 
a guy that a person who was 21 then right uh, would be 30 today right or the vice versa 30 year old has the mindset today of a 21 year old yes you know, and it's always seems to be always going up it's like now it's a new 40 is a new 20 yeah <laughs> well you know I, I look I look at photographs of right. my wife at right. 65 and she was matronly I look at my wife mm. who's 65 and she's a babe <laughs> She's young looking, and she right, dresses right. that way, and she acts that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's come a long way. I think Toronto was a time where the city was built on industry, right? That's what manufacturing. Yeah, it was like a yeah. it was a hard. To, I think what I think what's at play today. Yeah. Uh, and has led to a very dynamic, creative ethos in, in Toronto uh, is um, the multicultural nature of, of Toronto. Right. Uh, we've got over 200 languages spoken on the streets of Toronto. Wow. Uh, and among the cultures that have been attracted to Toronto are cultures that are very business-oriented, Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurial. Remember, I was talking to you earlier about Thomas Sowell and right. uh, and his argument that uh, that uh, there are differences between cultures, and some cultures are more flexible, more adaptable, uh, more business oriented than others. And we've attracted many of them to Toronto, and we have as well, as a result of unprecedented churn in the economy, um, we've had to turn to. Uh, uh, we had to become economically, uh, or in a, in, a, in a career way, we've had to become more flexible. Right. Um, we're starting more businesses than ever before. They're smaller in their scope, but um, you know the the, the uh, people that are starting them are bringing an enormous enthusiasm, uh, you know, to to their particular businesses, and every business that you create creates the opportunity for growth and job creation uh, and wealth production. So, um, you know, this, the, this, um, I, I'm struggling to, to articulate it, but in my mind I just see, you know, people coming together uh, from all these perspectives and all these cultures and, and working with each other and bouncing ideas off each other and, you know, hey, have you thought of this? Or if we did this, and you don't need a lot of money uh, often to get, you know, the enterprise off the ground. And the electronic revolution, while it's destroying some businesses, is creating a spectrum of opportunities that just simply weren't there before. Mm -hmm. Entirely. You know, um, speaking of creativity, I want to ask you, because you've been in politics for so long, you've been sort of in the system, have you ever worried about how that might affect your own creativity or your own individuality, or has it, I mean, conversely, no. has it enhanced it? No, I, I, uh, history is giving me a unique perspective. Right. Um, I'm fascinated by people and how they organize themselves and you know, what they consider valuable in one period, maybe not in the others. Uh, it gives me a, uh, I'm less afraid of change because I understand, at least from a Western perspective, change has been the only constant that we've looked at. Right. Um, now we're changing faster than ever before. Uh, and Thomas Homer Dixon argues, mm -hmm. not only are we changing more rapidly than previously, but we're becoming more complex mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. But so, that academic side of me um, makes me uh, enjoy, you know, what I see, what I see happening, and allows me, I think, to cope with it, right, uh, in a in a very practical and pragmatic way. Sorry. So yeah, go ahead, George. Yeah, so we're almost reaching the end here. So my final question is: oh, first off, I want to say that I think what I'm getting from a lot of the stuff you're saying is that you're a collaborator. And I think that that is a really important thing for almost anyone because as basic as just like uh, an analogy of a, a musical band performing. Generally speaking, each one of those players is not going to be quite as solid as the whole band collaborating at the same time. And I think it's interesting what you say about 
you know, seeing both sides, the left and the right, and then sort of being able to merge them or seeing this sort of hip hop culture stuff and trying to merge that with politics. It's, it's a very, I think it's a very excellent technique and I think it's, I mean, it's, it's working, right? So, mm-hmm. but uh, my, my final question is what's, what's next for Norm Kelly? Good question. Um, um, I'm of an age now where uh, um, you uh, you know that you're mortal, uh, and a number of guys that I went to school with, grew up with, are no longer around. So um, you don't uh, you know I'm at the age where if you you plant a tree, it's an art, it's an act of faith because you chances are you're not going to be around to see it grow. Um, so who knows? Uh, I may. Um, I'm still in good health. I may run for office, counselor again. Mm-hmm. Um, I may retire. Um, I kept notes during my mayoralty. Right. Uh, I might sit down and try and write a book. Um, I might um, join a, a university or a college and uh, maybe teach a course. You know, I still enjoy that. In fact, part of, my, part of the attraction that I have, maybe the essential attraction that I have for politics, is that I've never ceased to be a student. You're always learning something. It's true, yeah. uh, You're reading your agendas. You're out talking to not only your constituents, but people in the business community, social, religious, ethnocultural, and you're learning all about what's going on. You're trying to figure out, you know, how the all these pieces work, mm-hmm. and then, and I'm reading. I read widely, right? Um, <clears throat> and in the end, when I think I've got a handle on something, I then turn and teach it, wow. and I teach it to my colleagues. I teach it to my constituents. I teach it to a vast audience through, right? You know, vehicles yeah. like this. Yeah. So in a way, I've never ceased being a student, and I have never stopped teaching. And I try to do it with as much fun Mm -hmm. uh, and appreciation uh, for the sensibilities of others, you know, as I can. And you can always start that rap career. Yeah, I was going to say, (laughs) keep keep that in mind, we'll do it. Well, listen, I've got a student body at Ryerson that has often said to me, hey, why don't we get together and do something? Yeah, we'll produce it. Who knows? i got a whole catalog of beats. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 